to live in an isolated province in China with their seven-year-old daughter, Florence. Emma was a very home-loving person. She had her family here. She loved them dearly, and it was very hard for her to leave. She longed for letters from home and from her loved ones. She was very lonesome, but they wanted to do something for the betterment of the world, and to uh, spread Christianity was their way. So again, the idea was they would go learn Chinese. They would live in very primitive conditions in China. Their daughter would learn Chinese so they can go ahead and win souls for the truth of Jesus. They would become evangelical Christians and converts. They would also go ahead and build wells, clean drinking water, go ahead and talk about the idea of civilizing. And, and you find this most clearly, you might have learned this last year, with the British, right? With the white man's burden of trying to go ahead and spread such ideas as soap, literacy, words, books, science, chemistry, things like this, to go ahead and take the childlike races, they actually use language like that, to take the childlike races and allow them to progress in the world to become more like the Europeans and the Americans. And again, especially in China, there were thousands of American missionaries living in China. And that becomes important, especially when it comes into the 20th century. So at the end, what do you have here? You have this territory here, which is the American sphere of interest, Europeans keep out, Cuba, Puerto Rico. Then you have Hawaii. You have Midway Island, Wake Island, Guam, the Philippines, American Samoa, which is right next to German Samoa. Americans and Germans were jockeying for position here. It's like the Americans and the Germans, and especially the Japanese, came late in the empire here, and so they're grabbing certain territories which are still left un untaken as a way of jockeying for empire. I mean, World War I, think about last year, World War I is nothing but giant empires finally colliding in, into conflict. Sooner or later that's going to happen. Here it is. Bottom line, America is a full-fledged member of the world powers. And they wanted that, and they got it. Okay? The reality, though, is it brings certain benefits, but it also brings certain responsibilities with regards to being involved in foreign affairs. Again, like Lee said, in 15 years here, World War I is going to break out. Can the Americans remain aloof from this bloody, bloody war if they are a world power? And the answer probably is no. Even more so, World War II. The United States can't. And, and, the, and the reality is, most Americans don't care what's going on in other parts of the world. But they can't avoid them because they're becoming a more powerful country and they're having their, their, their fingers in other pots around the world. So, you're going to see in this class, we're going to start talking a whole lot more about world affairs when we get into the 20th century as America arrives as a world power. Remember, in 1896, the United States made, economically, the materials of a world power. But politically, it was only just becoming accepted by other countries as a world power. The British first, right? That's going to change. By 1945, the United States is clearly the most powerful country in the world. Not so much that we're so powerful, but the rest of the world suffered so much from World War II. Think about that. War of 1812, no one gave any respect to the Americans. They were kind of a semi-legitimate country in the middle of nowhere. By 1945, the United States is clearly the most powerful country in the world. That's a huge change in only a couple, couple decades, a couple generations. And we'll talk a lot about that. Okay, do anyone have any questions here about the insular cases, the, the Platt and Teller Amendments, the USS Maine, reasons why we went to war, Theodore Roosevelt, San Juan Hill, any questions about that? Jennifer, you good? No questions. Wait, um, yeah. how do you spell the hill again? San, San Juan. S-A-N, San Juan. new word, uh, J-U-A-N. Oh, oh, San Juan. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Could you spell the classification <coughs> you think you're talking about? Okay, inside Cuba, mm -hmm. the Cuban rebels lived in the countryside where they would give help from the people who lived there. The Spanish government, their generals tried to get the entire countryside to live in special supervised cities, mm -hmm. special concentration camps. And by removing the people from the rebels who live in the jungle, you can weaken the rebels. Right. Now that worked, but it caused enormous hardship and almost starvation by the people who lived in these special concentration camps. And news of those things and photographs of that made it to American newspapers where American newspaper writers like Hearst could sell more newspapers with their sensations, their headlines, increasing pressure between the Spanish and American governments about what's happening 90 miles off the coast of Florida. So people who sent the camps weren't rebels? No. Okay. Maybe sometimes they were, but mostly they're just like peasants. And the rebels were out there was like, feed me, feed me, yeah. Uh, did like, Spain have any benefit of having uh, uh, an Cuba empire? and Philippines? Sure. Because they, they, they had a whole bunch of uh, insurrection, so was it still beneficial to them? You know, I think there's a whole lot of the pride of what they used to be going on. I mean, economically, did they benefit that much? I don't think so. Probably just the opposite. But there was still this feeling like, we are the Spanish. We are the people who are the, the, our empire. And it's hard for people to give those things up. 
So I don't think they were making a lot of money off Cuba in the Philippines in 1897. Answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I think the only empire they had after this was like a little bit of Morocco and then Spain. Oh. Uh, your family from Honduras. In 1899, could the Honduran government as a sovereign independent country allow the, the, the German Navy to have a base on their coast? Yes. No. They could, but the reality was the Americans would go ahead and complain and attack them. The Americans would say this, Honduras, you're a small country. The Americans are a big country. This is the American sphere of influence. Don't let any of these other major powers come into our backyard here. Do whatever you want, but the Germans are not welcome to have a major naval base off the coast of Honduras. And the Hondurans might say, we can do whatever we want. Well, theoretically, they can as a sovereign country, but practically speaking, the Americans will beat them up. Right? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and switch gears a little bit here. This is the last step which is on your test.